welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is From 30 Million to 55 Billion the strategic vision behind creative planning's extraordinary growth. It's a conversation with Peter Malouk, president and CEO of Creative Planning, Inc. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. Many suspected a drawback on the heels of a record-setting year in M&A, particularly in light of the pandemic. Yet, as TD Ameritrade Institutional reported in their 2020 Q1 and Q2 report on M&A activity, the first half of the year was yet another record-breaker with 80 transactions, more than the 75 reported for the same period in 2019. More than any six-month period looking back over two decades. It seems that despite the coronavirus, a roller coaster market, and changing valuations, buyers still see independent firms as a great investment. Yet, it's the mega RIA firms that seem to have an incredible appetite in the space as of late. One search firm made headlines three times in the span of just a few weeks with acquisition announcements this summer, two in mid-August, totaling $750 million and a $1.7 billion deal at the 1st of September. Peter Malouk, president and CEO of the $55 billion Overland Park, Kansas-based RIA firm Creative Planning, seems to be on a tear these days driving inorganic growth like never before. Yet, growing the business is certainly nothing new to Peter. He bought Creative Planning in 2004 when it had just $30 million in assets. By 2008, the firm had grown nearly 20x to $500 million in assets, but that was only the beginning. Five years later, the firm's assets soared another 2,000% to $11.8 billion. And what's really interesting about this story is that Peter is both a lawyer as well as a financial advisor who started his career helping other advisors handle estate planning for their clients. In that role, Peter found that most advisors were just too focused on gross investment returns. They paid little heed to taxes or to helping clients achieve specific financial goals. And they often charged sales commissions and sold in-house investments, which Malouk saw as a conflict of interest. So he purchased the financial planning boutique and went about creating what he calls a better kind of business. I've asked Peter on the show today to share his amazing story, his vision for the type of firm he was looking to build, and how both extraordinary organic growth and inorganic growth aligned with his strategic goals. We'll look under the hood of creative planning to get a better understanding of how they got where they are and where they are headed. We'll talk about how RIA firms can identify if they are better positioned to be a buyer or a seller and what they need to get there. Plus, we'll get his take on the M&A market and where he sees it all heading. There's a lot to discuss and let's get to it. Peter, I'm so incredibly grateful for your taking the time to talk with me today. Oh, it's good to be with you, Mindy. Thank you. All right. So you have an extraordinary background. And in fact, I feel like I'm in the presence of wealth management industry royalty. I know you graduated from the University of Kansas in 1993 with not one, but four majors, business admin, economics, political science, and psychology. And then in 1996, you earned a law degree and master's in business administration. 
And then in 2004, you purchased creative planning. What took you from graduating with an MBA in 96 to acquiring creative planning? What happened in between? I worked with a physician that I actually met in law school for a couple of years doing uh, legal work and business work for him and somehow got pulled into doing wills and trusts. And the next thing I knew, I was doing it for all kinds of doctors. And then I was doing it for other advisors, clients. And I did that for a long time, you know, all the way till 04. And then really got a feel for how the industry worked. And I think I saw at that point an opening, which was unique back then and today. You know, a lot of people do a lot of the same things. But back then, when we put this together, the observations I had seen of just how the brokerage world worked compared to the independent world, working for a firm that owned its own products versus one that didn't, being able to include planning without a separate fee, all of that was pretty unique in 04. And that was basically the concept. I guess a couple of things I want to unpack there. One, why creative planning? In other words, why acquire a firm as opposed to go out and build one from scratch? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's interesting. I don't know if anyone's bothered to ask me that question before, but it's uh, it's a great uh, opportunity to answer it. So really, I went to all my clients and creative planning was one of my clients since 98 to 04. I had done legal work for their clients and I had done financial planning for their clients. And I went to all the advisors I worked with and there were a lot of them. I mean, that's what I was doing morning till night was just going from one advisor to another and working with them. And I basically said I wanted to start a firm that did these things. And the owner of creative planning was ready to retire. He had had you know, one partner die young and one become disabled young. And he was pretty young. He was in his maybe mid fifties. And he just said, hey, you know, you already know these clients. Uh, there's a few dozen of them. Why don't you just take this over? And I did. In retrospect, I don't know. I, I mean, that was so incredibly helpful to have a few dozen people to start with and to really be able to not have to start with no clients. And it really had the legal framework done. And, you know, back then I was naive. I didn't know like what a compliance nightmare it was or a legal nightmare it was or all of that stuff. I just thought, oh, I'll just go open up. I mean, I, obviously, knowing what I know today, I'm super grateful that he gave me that opportunity to, to take over creative planning because I got to skip all of that stuff. And I, I mean, obviously, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it the same way. But it's really extraordinary that you did that because to me, what's going through my mind is, oh my God, where did the courage come from? I'm not sure how old you were at the time, but I'm assuming fairly young and had never owned your own firm. And where did the courage come from to say, I can do this? Well, I mean, I was in my late twenties, I think, and so I mean, it's more kind of like stupidity than courage. <laughs> I, I think is what really uh, drove a lot of it back then. The space was a lot different than it is today. You know, I mean, now there's all these multi-billion-dollar firms, and back then, I remember using my slow internet, looking up other firms, and just being blown away. You know, that there was a firm just four hours away from me that managed a billion dollars, and there were a couple firms in our city that managed 300 or 400 million dollars. And I thought, well, one day if we could ever get there, I mean, that was, it was just a different world back then. It felt a lot more boutique-y, a lot easier to get something done. Fees were so high. I mean, a lot of people were still buying commissionable mutual funds. Mutual fund fees were very high. It seemed like there was a natural opening. So there was like zero uh, fear or concern at all. I think, you know, today's a little different you know, fees are lower. A lot of people are doing planning. There's a lot of multi-billion dollar firms. There's a lot of things changing very, very rapidly. It requires very heavy investment in technology and compliance. And so I think I just had my ignorance combined with the marketplace allowed me to have, you know, no doubts about moving ahead. Yeah. And what was it in your background that you think gave you the courage? Was there some strength or mentor or something that you drew upon to sort of make you say, I can do this? I don't think so. I, th I think one of the things was had a good education. And so I, you know, you always have this fallback, right? <laughs> like, well, if everything else goes, you know, to hell, I can go do A, B or C. So it's always good, you know, to have that. But really, I just, I think the main thing was I really had total, complete confidence that what we were going to try to put together was going to work. I had zero ambition that it was going to work to even 2% of the level we are today. Like I never in my mind would have thought, oh, we'll you know, get to a billion dollar firm. I just thought, can I get, you know, a hundred clients together? I had total complete confidence. I could do that. And at that time, that was what you need, you know, that was what you needed to really stabilize a place. And so I think just 
having a long history of interacting with clients, having a long history of seeing other advisors, a long history of doing financial plans and, and legal work that was in the financial field. I think all of those things together were what it took. You know, everyone's got a different set of circumstances that gets them where they are. But for me, it was the right place, right time, and a lot of other the circumstances we've talked about. Yeah. You know, I'm smiling because my circumstances for starting Diamond Consultants was the same. I also, I was probably younger than you. I was probably mid-20s at the time. And I knew that I was a good recruiter, but I didn't have my sights set on building a firm. It was just about being a good recruiter. I think it was what you call sort of stupidity, which wasn't really (laughs) stupidity, I think, on either one of our parts that, you know, you're sort of too young to really be fearful and you go for it. So, um, and I want to, we'll come back to, I want to spend a lot of time talking about sort of how you got from there to here, but maybe for perspective, what did creative planning look like in the early years of the firm? How many on staff? How much in assets? Where did it begin? Well, I mean, it had, you know, tens of millions in assets and <laughs> there were three of us in that first year that really got it going. And the first person that I hired, Molly Rothov, is the, is the vice president of the firm uh, today. And we had, I mean, I think that was it, you know, dozens of clients and it was kind of the millionaire next door back then. A lot of them were business owners, doctors, folks like that. And, you know, I still work with almost all of them today. I mean, it's a really been a long, a long run with them. Amazing. So, okay. So now we're going to blow everybody's mind. What does creative planning look like today? Uh, Today we have approximately 730 or so employees. We manage about 55, 56 billion. We have um, probably, I would guess, 30,000 or so clients as a firm. And that's the core of what it's like today. And obviously there's a lot of different offerings today than there were back then as well. Mm-hmm. And what is your role in the firm today, Peter? So I'm the president and CEO, but mainly I'm a wealth manager. I mean, I'm, I'm meeting with clients more than I do anything else and meet with other, other advisors' clients, you know, helping them with certain cases. It's what I enjoy doing the most. I think in this particular profession, it really actually helps you be a better president and CEO. It helps you be a better leader because you know what people are looking for. You know what they're asking for. You don't wait for it to trickle up to your ivory tower to understand, you know, where the industry is moving and what people want. So I find it to be very helpful. I think the typical CEO president in our role is going to conferences all the time. And I think I learn a lot more being with our team and our clients than going to conferences. And so for me, it's the best use of my time and the thing I enjoy doing the most. Yeah, well, and I I am a firm believer that when you do what feels soulful, what fills you up, you're best at it. It's best for you, best for the business, best for the clients, best for your team, et cetera, et cetera. I agree. So what's creative planning secret sauce? What differentiates it from others other than size? Well, I think that back in the beginning, all those things were unique. I mean, the differentiation was that you we were using passive investments i mean t- today i think we're the largest holder of etfs of any ria and but i think back then it was very unique i had to explain what an etf was i had to explain what an alternative investment was i had to you know i was giving away free financial plans the every magazine you ever read said this is the dumbest thing ever that's pretty normal today or at least a lot of places do that so the difference today is experience I mean, there's just a ton of experience here. If somebody's got a question, there is a CPA or an attorney or a trust officer or a money manager or an option specialist or a bond specialist or CFP that can answer that question. So that to me is the big differentiator today. I think the industry has become more and more commoditized, but at the end of the day, what the client's paying for is what's between your ears. And uh, we have a lot of that here. And so I think that's the main difference today. The difference you need to compete today, uh, that we need to compete today is different than it was 10 years ago and different than it was at the beginning about 16 years ago. Yeah. And I think that that's absolutely right. So you mentioned already that when you purchased the firm in 2004, it wasn't your goal to build a mega empire but rather to get 100 clients, get to a billion hopefully someday, and never really saw past that at the time. But I'm wondering sort of when and how you went from what sounds like sort of building a good practice to really saying, I'm looking to build an enterprise. I think probably, and this might surprise you, I mean, maybe four years ago or so. I think around four years ago, we passed 15 billion. 
I think I've got that right. And I think it started to occur to me that something you know, we could do something special. And really what I found was there was a lot of momentum around our offering. And so about three and a half years ago, I really took over, built out leaders with, for all of our teams, invested in more of a national footprint, invested, and I know it's not a good thing to say today, but invested in some real estate for our offices. We invested in technology and really said, you know what, we're not just going to take what comes our way. We are going to go on a mission to try to become mm. you know, the leading independent national wealth management firm. And so I really getting intentional about it is a very, very recent thing. Up until very recently, it was just what else can we do for the client? What else can we do for the client? What else do we do mm -hmm. for the client? And it'll work out. And now it's the same thing. What else can we do for the client? But we are on a mission to really accomplish as an organization being that leading firm, that leading voice in the space. And I think, you know, opportunities sort of drove it as well, because simultaneous with your decision to be intentional about adding inorganic growth to the mix was a time when the industry, you know, there's so many standalone independents that want what you have. They lack scale, they lack capacity, they lack capital, they lack sort of the courage to really take themselves to the next level and beyond. And so to associate with a firm like Creative Planning that's doing such great things is of real appeal. And I know up until last year or so, the firm's growth was primarily all organic, which is pretty extraordinary that in its history, you probably got to, what was it, almost 50 billion in all organic growth? Yep, that's right. Which is extraordinary. So what drove the decision to become intentional about growing extraordinarily, not just growing organically? Well, I think when we got uh, about three and a half years ago, we really got a sense that to do the next step, to double, triple from there, it was going to require a whole new commitment. It was a forced choice. Like, hey, we don't fit in one building anymore. We started the year in one building and we ended the year in three or four buildings. It was just ridiculous. You know, people were tripled up in offices. I mean, CPAs were four to a room. It was crazy. And that was kind of a great metaphor for where the firm was at with everything. We kept basically had to say, look, if we're going to really do this, we have to really, really invest in technology and compliance and the team and everything. Or we just need to dial this thing down, you know, raise our minimums and uh, slow the growth. And maybe it was a couple of days of debating, and I'm not sure we ever really debated it. Once we really got to the conclusion that hey, this is what we wanted to do. We knew it was going to require a huge investment and we made it as, as quickly as we could. But the decision was kind of forced upon us uh, in a lot of ways. Meaning forced upon you because? Yeah, I think of like it's the same decision that somebody when they start out, they're on their own. And then at some point they've got to go, well, I need to hire somebody. But if I hire somebody, I'm kind of going backwards for a little while. Or mm -hmm. if I invest in this software, or firms, when they kind of to go from 500 million to a billion, they have to make some decisions about infrastructure that will lower their profit margins and so on in exchange for growth. And I think that just really happened to us, you know, on a much, much bigger scale. We were going to have to invest tens of millions of dollars in certain things to be able to, to go to the next level, whether it was technology or whatever. I mean, it's a good example. Not only do we go from one building to being in three or four in one calendar year, but we had no in-house tech people. Hmm. And you know, today, I think we have 20, 22 people in that group. That was like the kind of commitment we had to make to really be able to operate on a national scale the way we do today. Yeah. So let me back up for one second. Other than being good and having a lot of experience, the RAA space is a crowded and competitive space. So let's presume that a prospect has the choice of either having his money managed, say, by an advisor at a wirehouse firm, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, UBS, or in the RAA space. If we agree that the RIA space is crowded and competitive, there are a whole lot of firms that a client could choose from. What do you think are the top things that accounted for such extraordinary organic growth? And then I'm going to ask you the same thing about inorganic growth. Well, I think it was a de it depended what time it was. So in the, in the very beginning, you know, we were growing, you know, probably at our highest rate, you know, 50%, 150% a year. And a lot of that was I had had a very, very large estate planning practice. And a lot of those folks were my personal clients. 
And so I knew them well, and they came over. I think after that, you know, there was a lot of people that came over from our 401k group. But after that, we participated in the custodial programs. And, you know, those have contracted a lot. You know, several of the places have been bought and are gone, and, and others are contracting or going through mergers. And then you just have a lot of clients and you just get, you know, like in a typical month, like last month, most of our clients, they're referred by other clients. I mean, you just have a lot of clients getting 10 clients from 100, you know, we're, we're just going to get 1,000 clients from 10,000 clients. And so it, it really starts to drive the growth if you deliver to those folks. And so just like you can't get from A to B with the same technology, you can't go to 500 million, 1 billion, 10 billion, 50 billion, you're doing the same thing. Each one requires a little bit of a different approach. So I want to ask you about growth. You just mentioned that the firm participated in the custodians referral programs. A lot of our listeners may not be aware of what that is and how it works and how impactful was being a part of those programs to your growth. Well, I think it was great for us. I mean, that that's where, you know, a client would be at a custodian. And if the custodian thought they'd be better served with an RA, they'd refer them out. Those most of the firms that have done those, they've been bought, right, by other by other companies and they either don't exist or they're about to not exist, or the program might get shut down because they've been bought by a brokerage house. And so it's really changed and the remaining players have really reduced the number of advisors they have in the plan and, and they're offering and really increased the amount of assets you have to have there. So it's not nearly what it was today. You know, these custodians now have a lot of in-house offerings, but if you go back Five years ago, it was, you know, it was fantastic as they really didn't have the sophisticated in-house solutions. And so the client could win by getting to a sophisticated advisor. The advisor could win by meeting somebody they wouldn't win before, meet before. And the custodian could win by keeping the client on their platform and, and you know, collecting a, a referral fee. And so it's just the landscape has changed so much, so fast, as it does, I think, every couple of years in this industry. And I think it's going to change in a big, big way uh, in the next five as well. But there was a time it was it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. And what role has marketing and social media and digital marketing played in growth? So we did a nine month run uh, a couple of years ago where we experimented with digital media, TV, and radio. It wound up working for us, but some things worked and some things didn't. And we're going to relaunch all of that here in twenty twenty one. But in terms of like, what did it contribute to, you know, the 55 or 56 billion we managed today? I mean, maybe 2% or some one, you know, something very, very, very small, but I think it can work. We've proven in some spaces, it definitely can work. And I think we're going to be much more effective at it going forward. Yeah. All right. So now I want to pivot to, so you've had this extraordinary run of organic growth, but you mentioned that you all of a sudden became intentional about wanting to really ramp up that growth and add inorganic growth to the mix. And for anyone not familiar with the term, meaning begin to focus on M&A, recruiting, et cetera. So today, Creative Planning is both an RIA firm that manages money for its clients, but also a serious acquirer of independent practices. In fact, it's reported that you completed three deals in just the span of a few weeks. In August of this year, there was an acquisition of $600 million Lennox Wealth Management in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then $150 million Miller Financial Management in Indiana. And then on September 1st, in fact, just prior to the recording of this show, your firm announced their biggest deal yet, acquiring the $1.7 billion firm Atlanta-based RIA True Wealth. So, First of all, what was it about those firms that made them attractive targets for creative planning? Well, I mean, for us, basically what we found is we think we're going to get more referrals from clients, you know, in the next 12 months than we ever have. And we're continuing to focus on organic growth. So for, for us, this isn't really in place of anything we were doing before. As with everything we've done, it's just in addition to and I think we just weren't ready to do acquisitions. We were still building out our offering. I mean, we've only had a trust company for a few years. We've only had a real solid tax harvesting as tax uh, uh, offering for five years or so. I mean, it took a while to build these things out. We had a planning team, legal team, investment team, and so on. But all these other things that we do today, it took a long, long time to get them where they needed to be. And we really wanted to build all of that in-house because it really enabled us to understand it inside and out, have it be part of our DNA instead of a bolt-on and so on. 
And then we established a presence in every major market. So there is no market we've done an acquisition in where we weren't there already, usually managing more money than the firm we acquired. And so what we're trying to do is get more competitive in these markets faster. I think the irony of it is, even though we, you know, we may be the fastest organically growing firm that does planning and investments from our inception to today, and if not, I'm sure we're in the you know, top few firms, but I don't think it's fast enough to compete on a national scale for where the industry is heading. I think the industry, we're really going to see economies of scale and technology and compliance and fee compression and all of these things really drive the way the marketplace looks in the next five years. And so if we have a solid presence in Cincinnati, but we're managing 500 million, we have a great team. Well, if we get together with another firm that manages about the same amount of money, well, now all of a sudden we're one of the larger firms in Cincinnati, right? So it enables us to be more top of mind, to get more brand awareness and to be more competitive. And we don't just want to be in these markets. You know, we're already in all of these markets. We're already in Atlanta and Dallas and Milwaukee and Minneapolis and all the places we've purchased a firm, we were already there. What we want to do is we want to raise the brand awareness. We want to be more competitive. If we do digital marketing or TV or radio, we want people who have already heard of us. You know, these things have a layering effect. And so acquisitions are enabling us to get more competitive in those local markets quicker. Even at our pace, you know, it would have taken us maybe three years to double in those markets. That's an infinity in, at the, inside the realm of the pace that's happening right now in this industry. And I uh, just didn't have the, we don't have the patience for that. And so we're really trying to find folks that are philosophically aligned. They're planning led or willing to be planning led approach to investing, very tax sensitive approach to investing, a similar investment philosophy, similar culturally to us. And if we find that great, you know, we'll do it all day long. And if we don't, we're not going to force it either. You know, so we're not at, under any time pressure other than I think that this is where the market's heading and we want to be in front of it. Yeah. You're looking not at growth just for growth's sake, but you use that word intentional. You want to be intentional about it. But let me ask you a question. So it sounds like, for example, you chose Cincinnati, Ohio, because as you said, it's a place you already had a presence. But let's say a firm approached you that wanted to be acquired that, I'm making this up, was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a right, place where right. you don't necessarily have clients. Would, if the firm were philosophically aligned or culturally aligned, would that be an area that you'd open in or are you only looking for markets where you already have a presence? You know, that's a great question because I, you know, people will ask me all the time, well, would you be interested in this firm because you, you don't have a presence there? Or would you be interested in this firm because you do have a presence there? And I'm interested in being competitive, right? I'm interested in being in a position to be ahead of fee compression and all the other things where I think the market's going. And we're not really present anywhere. You know, we're maybe a couple mm. of markets, you know, two or three markets, like our headquarters and a couple others. Everywhere else, we're not at the scale we need to be. So if, if someone called me and they were in Memphis where we don't have a presence, yes, I'd be very interested in establishing a presence there. If we just purchased a billion seven firm, amazing firm, True Wealth in Atlanta, very proud of that. And our team there is amazing. And so they're quickly, you know, in the top three or four, probably in, in town there. We're still interested in talking to firms from Atlanta because our goal is to win, you know, in that market. And so even at our size, we are still so very, very small, mm. really just very small, but almost anywhere. So to me, it's less about location and it's more about, is it a philosophical match, cultural match? Yep. And if it's a philosophical and cultural match, well, kind of the, the whole map is a blank canvas still, and we're just still in the early phases of all of this. Mm -hmm. So what about from the firm's perspective, just looking at those three firms you've acquired, what made your firm, what made creative planning attractive to each of them? I mean, I go back to this crowded and competitive marketplace. There is not an RIA firm that's been around for a couple of years that isn't interested in acquiring. So I imagine that if any one of these firms approached just about any quality RIA firm, they'd be thrilled to be in the game. Why creative planning for them? Well, I think if you're a, in a firm, a smaller firm, you're basically looking at it and going, what's best for my clients? What's best for my advisors? And what's best for me, right? And people have a different order that they put it with. And I think that there's two groups of people out there that own RAs. There's the people that know this, where this industry is heading and those that are in denial, right? So those that know where it's heading, 
either need to figure out how to get bigger fast or become part of something bigger so they can give their clients what, what their competitors can give them and so that they can continue to have a growth opportunity for their staff and so that they can monetize their life's work before the opportunity to monetize it goes away. That's just the reality of the space. I think everyone, you know, 80% of people are aware of that, which is why you're seeing all the mergers and acquisitions happen. They wouldn't happen for any other reason. Um, now, I think that when somebody's deciding to do that, there's not as many choices as there appear to be. It sounds like there's 100 acquirers, you know, but really there's about 10. And of those 10, there's maybe four or five bigger ones. And they do very different things. Like I, I look at some other acquirers that I just have a tremendous amount of respect for their leadership. And I, I put in that group, Hightower and Focus. Mm -hmm. But they're just very different than creative, right? So creative planning is basically, hey, your brand is going to become creative planning. Your offering is the creative planning offering. If this sounds awesome to you, uh, for, for you to deliver to your clients, then you're going to love creative planning because we're all going to be doing the same thing, working the same way, trying to follow the same philosophy of planning-led approach and tax-sensitive investing and not using hedge funds, but using other alternatives, all the philosophical things that we do. If someone's aligned with that, we're going to be a great choice. Now, if you're somebody that's saying, look, I want to keep doing everything the way I'm doing it today for the most part, well, we're not a great choice. Maybe focus is a great choice. And then there's, you know, Hightower, right? Some, I don't want to speak for these other firms, but they're all great firms. Uh, they just completely different ways of doing things. And so I think as a seller, if you're saying, look, I want to be part of an integrated wealth management firm, there's only a couple options that are really viable. And we're one of them. And I think they look at creative planning and say, look, creative planning has attracted more clients than other firms. And I think owners of RAs know this, that they kind of see through growth that's been done by acquisition versus growth that hey, people actually chose that firm. And they know that a lot of people chose creative planning. And so I think it makes them more interested in, in learning more about potentially working with us because they feel like, hey, if we join creative planning, maybe we'll attract more clients. If we join a firm that just bought 100 other firms, they haven't really proven they have an offering, right? They've just proven they can buy firms. It's a very different equation. So you said, and I get it totally, that for an advisor that says, or a principal, I want to be part of an integrated wealth management firm, they would look at creative planning or any one of the other, as you say, you know, acquirers in that space. But the other option are the investors in the space. So say like a high tower or focus, and there are others as well. What would that principle be saying to themselves? What would make somebody feel that it's a better idea to sell to high tower or focus than to sell to creative planning? Well, I think like if you're an advisor that wants to keep your own brand, and you want to keep your own offering, your own investment approach, and whether you don't have to do planning, maybe you do, maybe you don't, maybe you use hedge funds, whatever, you know, focus is agnostic on all of that, right? Mm -hmm. But if you also think it's a good idea to take chips off the table, you know, they'll give you cash and, and they'll give you stock, right? So again, I, I hope I have their story right. I like Rudy a lot and I'm impressed with what he's done. But the point is like, if you wanna keep running your own show and doing your own thing, but have a, a path to you know exit a little bit, they're a, a great option. And so it's just different than a place that's saying, I'm trying to find a new offering for my clients. I'm trying to find a new offering for my employees. Uh, although I'm sure the you know places like Focus have different types of options, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that we're all a little bit unique in what our, our core way of doing things is. And there's just not that many big acquirers out there. So speak of big acquirers. Many smaller firm owners actually worry that to sell to a massive firm means that they will lose themselves, lose their identity. And I don't just mean their brand name, but lose everything that made them them, how they do things, how they service clients and autonomy and brand, et cetera. So how would you respond to that concern? And did the principles of the three firms you've recently acquired feel that way at all? Well, I, part of this is true. I mean, you are going to lose your brand, right? And the brand is part of the identity. There's just no way around it. Even when we changed our logo at Creative Planning, it was a little bit emotional for me. I mean, you're as an owner, you get tied to the brand. Now, I think in terms of the rest, I have found the people that have built a successful RIA, you know, manages a few hundred million to a few billion dollars. That's a very small, very small group of people. And they're usually optimistic and pragmatic. 
And so they get, I, in my experience, they're excited about it. Like, hey, I got to this point, which is enabling me to be part of creative planning and our team. It's just part of the journey, right? You go, I was able to get big enough that I could be part of this. And now I'm going to be more competitive in my backyard. And at the end of the day, they're usually going to the same office. They're going back to the same desk with their same clients, with the money at the same custodian. It's not like the table's turned upside down. But the changes usually are overwhelmingly positive. I mean, you're usually picking up, uh, usually your day gets a little bit easier once you figure out the technology. You It gets easier to, to help clients because there's more solutions for the clients in-house. And so in general, I found them to be very, very happy, not just the owners, but the teams uh, once they come over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been our experience because we've worked with many of those smaller RIA firms that are recognized that they're sort of at a crossroads. They need to do something. They worry about losing themselves. And the only way they actually get comfortable with selling to anyone, creative planning or otherwise, is to believe that the potential value add is far greater than what they stand to lose. And that puts the onus on the buyer to prove to them that it will be a better scenario. Yeah. That's right. So in February of this year, Peter, you took on creative planning, took on a private equity investor, General Atlantic. Was the purpose of that to give you additional capital to be more of an enterprise building M&A machine? Actually, no. I mean, I'd done four or five before General Atlantic came along, before we did a deal with General Atlantic, and we've done maybe six since then. But none of the money that General Atlantic put in the creative play, none of it's going to be used for acquisitions or for anything else. It was just really taking chips off the table. I think valuations are mm. very, very, very high. So going back to what I talked about earlier with trying to get much larger to be able to remain competitive, I think that's because margins are going to come down. And so, you know, I'm in it to win it. I'm having a good time. I want creative planning to become a hundred billion a dollar nationally recognized independent firm that can take on uh, the brokerage houses or at least kick them in the shins a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm in for here, but I have no confidence <laughs> that when I get there, uh, that valuations will be anywhere near where they are today. So I basically just said, look, I'm going to invest in what I need to, to get this firm ready to be a hundred billion dollar firm. And three years ago, we did that, you know, from tech to real estate and personnel and everything else. But looking at where valuations are and all the activity in this space, just that I'm going to take a little part of this off the table and it just sits on the sidelines. So none mm -hmm. of it is being used to purchase businesses or invest in any. All the investments have been done that were needed to go where we need to go prior. That's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about the your thoughts on building a firm. On the one hand, you make it sound easy that you have 1,000 clients and you get 10,000 referrals and we get that, but not everybody gets there. So if you were talking to a nascent firm owner, somebody either now who just launched a firm or somebody who was thinking about going independent for the first time, what advice would you give them about how to build the best firm possible? You know, I don't know that I'm even the best person to say that because you I mean like the last time I did this was 20 years ago and it wasn't even really starting one. It was buying one that at least had, um, you know, a few dozen clients. And frankly, all I've learned is it's probably harder today uh, than back then. I mean, I think if you're at a brokerage house and you have your own clients and you can leave with those clients, I think this, you know, with the right consultant and is a pretty easy deal. I think if you're just popping out into the independent world without having built your own practice somewhere else, I think it's very, very difficult. And I think probably, I guess, meandering my way to one piece of advice, it's very crowded to the point you brought up, Mindy, at the, at the beginning of this. Very, very, very crowded and very competitive now. So carving out a niche is probably the smartest way to do it. Mm -hmm. Like only working with or really emphasizing one group of people to where you can with a little bit of uh, hard work and luck, you can start to be a bigger player in that little area is probably the quickest path to success. Basically, any industry as it gets saturated, that becomes the way to penetrate later. 
Yeah. You know, you talk about your choice to have bought a firm as opposed to building from scratch. In today's day and age, somebody without any assets under management wouldn't even have the opportunity to buy a firm because the market is as crowded and competitive as it is. Even a firm, as you said, creative planning with only tens of millions under management at the time would still have its you know, it's real pick of the litter in terms of who they wanted to buy them. And they certainly wouldn't choose somebody who didn't come with a book of business or a, a firm behind them. But from your perspective, and even though it's been a long time since you were starting a firm, what would you say to somebody that was already in business, an RIA firm, and that was thinking about gaining access to capital, sources of capital? What would you advise them? I mean, if you're starting from scratch, I think you're basically friends and family at that point. I mean, there I don't know that there is any other way to get access to capital to starting from scratch without just going to people you know. I can't imagine a bank or a third party of any kind, you know, bankrolling that from day one. I mean, I don't even think you have choices besides that. Yeah. Well, and how about a firm, an extant firm? So a firm that's, you know, 500 million or a billion under management that wants to either take some chips off the table, as you mentioned, or wants to be able to get in the game as far as M&A and can't do it without access to capital. What are their options and how should they think about when the right time is to begin to do that? Well, I think if you're 500 million, like, institutional investors are not going to be interested because if you think about what private equity likes, private equity wants a platform. You know, they want to buy something where they can uh, tuck other people into it, right? They can get other firms to put it under it. But at 500 million, you don't really have an institution. You know, you kind of have your own, your own business and you know all the clients and it's all about you usually still or a very tiny group of people. So taking chips off the table in a model like that means selling part or all of your firm to one of these aggregators, like a Focus or a Hightower, or selling all of it uh, to a creative planning or a place like that. And those become your options to you know, continue to grow and take some chips off the table. And when, when should a firm owner begin to think, gee, maybe it's really time to think about selling? I get all these calls all the time from interested parties. When is the right time to begin to think about really entertaining them seriously? Well, I think it really has to do with what are your goals. So if you're having a great time and you don't care, you know, like maybe you're making a good living and you don't care if your fees decline in the future or if you might see more attrition five or seven years down the road or you don't think you can grow as fast and you're okay with it, well, then you should never sell, right? So to me, it's it shouldn't just be about money. It should be about what you want. But if you're somebody going, hey, I... I would like to be more competitive or I'd like to offer more to my clients and I'm going to have to invest so much to get there. Uh, I don't want to do that. Well, then you should start looking. Or if you're looking at valuations and you're motivated by maximization, you should be looking now, you know, too, just looking at what's going on in the environment. And that's actually, that brings me to my next question. So we agree that right now valuation multiples are at a high watermark. And so what are your thoughts about structuring an acquisition deal, whether that be for you as an acquirer or for a seller? Well, I think valuations are at all-time highs. I cannot imagine they will ever go higher than this. So to me, the question is, are they just going to stay here you know, or, or not? But I don't see them going any higher. I mean, they're really they're a, a combination of a bunch of things, which is private private equity interest and strategic interests, the activity in the space itself, low interest rates and access to capital, generally strong long bull market. All of those you're checking all those boxes. If one of those things moves the other way, valuations contract. Two or three move the other way, uh, they contract a lot. And so. If it's somebody who's like thinking about it or thinking about doing it in the next few years, they should be doing it right now. Yeah. I mean, there's just no question that if it's something you're po someone's pondering and they're thinking two years, three years, wake up three years from now and, and not accomplish what you can accomplish today, even if you grew your firm by 20 or 30 percent in the meantime. And so this is a type of market that the that someone thinking about things should start thinking really long and hard about whether to make a move now or not. Yeah. And are there things from your perspective that a seller could do to impact their multiples? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, what a buyer likes to see is that all your eggs aren't in one basket. So you don't want disproportionate amount of your revenues tied to just a couple of clients. They like to see strong retention. You know, so if you're buying a $100 million firm that loses 10% of their clients a year versus a $100 million firm that gains 2% a year, those are worth very, very different amounts, right? So they like to see that. They like to see that you are able to find a way to grow on your own. They like to see the not a lot of turnover with the staff. I mean, nobody wants, if everyone's quitting on you all the time, then probably the problem has something to do with you. And so the buyer would be concerned about that. They're looking at all of those things. Like if I buy this practice, am I really going to get, are these advisors going to be interested and are the clients going to be interested in staying and will it grow? If anything you can do to move those levers is a positive thing. So what we're talking about is a seller's market. The fact that it is a seller's market, as you say, that valuation multiples are at an all-time high, and the question is not whether they will go higher, but whether they will stay here. How does that impact creative planning's interest in being an acquirer going forward? Well, I mean, for us, there's added benefits, right? So even though valuations are very, very high, we will pay the premium to become more competitive in a local market where that firm combined with our firm can grow faster. You know, so if we're growing at 15% and they're growing at 8% and together we raise our profile in the market, we can all grow faster. That's what allows us to pay the premiums that exist in the marketplace today. So you really need a unique buyer to kind of pay the levels of where things are at currently. Mm -hmm. So the RIA space in general has really grown tremendously in the past decade. What do you think the next best thing is, the next big thing rather is for the RIA space? And what do you think are the unique challenges facing the space as we go forward? Well, I think that the one big thing is the thing none of us know. You know, there's just always something out there that changes everything. The RIA space is just dependent on a lot of things, you know, talent and uh, demand and the markets and so on. But I think one trend that is inevitable is we have seen fees go to zero with the custodians on trading. We've seen commissions go to zero on selling mutual funds. We've seen mutual fund fees start to approach zero. We've seen ETF fees in some cases actually go to zero. And that's going to happen here too. The fees are going to come down and they're going to come down as firms get scale. And when they get scale, they can do more for less. And when that happens, then you start to see compression. That is 100% inevitable. For some reason, I stand pretty alone on this hill in the industry. Um, I think everyone is delusional and that fees, there is going to be fee compression and that it's going to come quicker than people think. And it's going to come from firms that get the scale to be able to do it. And they'll trade the lower margins in exchange for more market share. And we've made that decision many times at Creative Planning to trade lower margins for more market share, and, and we'll do it again. So I think that's the next big challenge in the industry. And while I know the margins of the industry seem super healthy, it doesn't take too long of a flat or downward sloping market coupled with some fee compression to make all of it go away. Yeah. So Peter, one last question for you. What is the next big thing for creative planning? I mean, the goal that you said is to double, to go from, or, or less than double actually at this point, to go from 55 or 56 billion to 100 billion. But how do you get there? What are the next big things you intend to achieve? Well, I think for us, it's a culmination of a lot of things that you asked me about on this. And we've already made the investment in talent and technology and locations and everything else. And we're going to continue to grow organically. We're hopeful 2021 will be our best organic growth year ever. We're going to supplement that with acquisitions with like-minded firms. And we're going to add marketing to it. And hopefully when we put all of that together, we can do what we did in the last three years, which is double and um, kind of achieve that short-term goal that we have. It's extraordinary. Well, my money's on you. So I'm excited to continue to watch you execute on your vision. It's extraordinary to have gone from a firm with tens of millions under management to 55, 56 billion. It's not hard to imagine that that short-term goal, the next short-term goal of getting to 100 billion is really achievable. And I hope that you'll uh, stay in touch with us and can come back on at some point to talk about how you got there. Thanks for having me, Mindy. It really, it's been fun following you in the industry and appreciate you having me. Pleasure.
As Peter shared, he has a lofty goal to grow creative planning to $100 billion. And with his track record, I certainly wouldn't bet against him. He's identified the right formula for strategic inorganic growth in an extremely competitive marketplace. As such, his advice for firms looking to sell should be heated. With valuations at an all-time high, now is the time to sell. And with plenty of quality buyers like Creative Planning out there, it's still very much a seller's market. I thank you for listening, and I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the Tools and Resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. 